This time, uh, uh, Professor James Collins worked for the uh, Center for Ethnic Studies, or KITA, at uh, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, or National University of Malaysia in Selangor, Malaysia. He was previously uh, the director of uh, Southeast Asian uh, Center at Northern Illinois University because he has done many research in Malay and Malay dialects in Indonesia, especially in the northern part of Indonesia, southern part of Indonesia, Kalimantan, and then some parts in Malaysia. So not to uh, use more time, so I think I give the opportunity to Prof. James Collins to talk about his uh, paper. So the title is Languages and Civilizations, um, and I'm going to focus on uh, what I call Southeast Asia Maritime Civilization. So um, I looked at a few scholars and their definitions of civilization. So we have uh, Rodel, a famous French historian, uh, and also Huntington, who wrote a rather controversial book about uh, 20 years ago. Um, when we look at the definitions of civilization, uh, they talk about um, a complex, a locus, with a great variety of cultural characteristics, or uh, many common objective elements. So in the perspective of uh, these uh, scholars, Frenchman and American, uh, language is only one of many uh, elements or characteristics of civilization. This is an interesting issue too because um, people talk about uh, Islamic civilization uh, as a single concept, as a single phenomenon. And I'm more uh, inclined to talk about uh, Muslim civilizations, the plural, okay? Um, in any case, uh, whatever is the case in Western civilization, or Chinese civilization, language in Muslim civilizations, I think, plays a significant role. Language is not just one of many elements, but is Mm. but is uh, what I think is a significant element. It is the element that shapes, maintains, and mirrors civilization. And I think that that's what the committee had in mind when they picked the title for this second uh, ESO. Uh, language is a critical element of civilization, especially in uh, Islamic civilizations. Um, in this paper, I very briefly talked about the role of Arabic, as a sacred and canonic language of Islam, uh, studied from one end of the Islamic uh, realm to another, and also provides a, provides a solid framework for theological education, shared discourse, and common identity. If we look at civilizations that have been impacted or infused by Islam, we can see uh, that there are two patterns, especially in Asia. In westernmost Asia, we see one pattern of the connection of language with civilization. And then what I call beyond the Euphrates, the other side of Iraq, we see another pattern of language use, what Urani called the frontier in Iran. So in uh, Western Asia, in westernmost Asia, uh, if we look at uh, Palestine or Lebanon, Syria, uh, even if we go to northern Africa, we see that Arabic replaced all the other languages of that area as the home language, not simply as the language of religion and education and literature, but even as the home language. There are some exceptions, but by and large, the whole area of westernmost Asia and even most of northern Africa uh, speak Arabic as their home language. And this is very different uh, on the other side of the, of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Once we leave Damascus and move to the, uh, to the east, we see a completely different pattern of language use. Arabic remains the language of religion and learning, but Arabic did not emerge as the home language. 
It is not used as a language of administration, nor is it the chief literary language in those countries to the east of Iraq. So we see two different patterns of language use. That's why I, well, we'll see what, what implications that is. Iburina told me that uh, we were supposed to have speakers from Iran and from Pakistan, but I think they didn't come. They had some problems. Mm. So luckily, my paper actually briefly discusses Urdu and uh, uh, Persian, Parsi. Uh, let's see. If we can get that. So we have two major languages east of, uh, well, we have many major languages east of uh, east of Iraq. But we can see, uh, in the case of Persian, if you look at my paper, which I think is in the proceedings, uh, I discuss very briefly uh, the uh, Islamic conquest of Persia, uh, the collapse of the Safavid Empire, uh, and the replacement of Persian with Arabic in all of what is now uh, contemporary Iran. But that only lasted for 100 or 200 years. Within a very short period of time, uh, Arabic was retained as the language of religion and uh, religious education and some forms of literature, but Persian made a uh, uh, comeback and became the language of administration, the language of daily use, the most important language in Iran. So although Iran is very famous as a, as a very strong uh, Islamic country, uh, the language of Iran is definitely Persian. Uh, Arabic is a uh, language for Islam and religious teaching. Uh, if we go a little further in history and look at the position of Urdu uh, in Pakistan and India, again we can see that in neither Pakistan nor in the Islamic communities of India, even at the height of the Mughal Empire, one of the great Islamic empires of northern India, uh, Arabic never replaced local languages. In fact, the very, very local colloquial language of Delhi, uh, which at that time was called Hindi, uh, became the national language of both Pakistan and India, although with different names and different uh, ways of writing. So in Pakistan, Urdu, which is Hindi, written in Arabic script, uh, with many new innovations in vocabulary that are drawn from Arabic, Persian. Uh, th this is another country where Arabic is very important as the language of education, the language of religion, the languages of, of religious education, but it did not replace any of the many languages of, uh, of Pakistan. So, so we see in, in the Islamic world, we see two basic patterns of language use. One in which Arabic replaced the indigenous languages of westernmost Asia and even northern Africa uh, and became the home language as well as the language of religion. And then beginning in Iran, which is what Burana called the frontier Iran, the language frontier. Beginning in Iran, as we move further east in Asia, Arabic did not replace uh, other local languages. Among them, and among them the most important maybe, Persian and Urdu, for example. Okay, so we see in this notion of a language and civilization nexus at our connection, uh, the Malay language in maritime Southeast Asia is the driving force for the emergence of a distinctive civilization. Okay, this is maybe my claim in the paper that people might want to ask questions. Malay in Southeast Asia, what I call maritime Southeast Asia, is the driving force for another uh, uh, Islamic-based civilization. So the first section uh, is uh, called The Emergence of Malay as a Written Language of Learning and Administration. So everybody knows this because the data for this mostly comes from Sumatra. So almost everybody here is from Sumatra. So well, there are those people from Kandari, I don't see them. Are the people from Makassar, where are they? I don't see them. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about now is uh, the history of Malay as a written language. Okay, so in Muarakaman, I've been there, Muarakaman in 
eastern Kalimantan is where we find the oldest inscriptions of Sanskrit, not Malay, Sanskrit. They date from the 4th century. So sometimes dated at about 380, sometimes dated at around 340. But anyway, in the 4th century, this is one of the yupa that has uh, Sanskrit engraved on it. These are stones that were erected somewhere in East Kalimantan to commemorate uh, a sacrifice of uh, cattle. Uh, this is a Hindu relic and it's written in Sanskrit using an Indic syllabary script, sometimes called uh, Palawa. Uh, that's the oldest inscriptions of Sanskrit in, uh, in Indonesia, or uh, almost the oldest in Southeast Asia. It, it rivals some inscriptions in Cambodia. Now, in February 686, here in Sumatra, if Bangka is part of Sumatra, we we'll call Sumatra, uh, we have the Kotakapur inscription, which is uh, an ancient description, description, uh, inscription uh, 1,300 years ago, written in uh, the Indic script, which was the same Indic script used in East Kalimantan, but not for Sanskrit, for Malay. So starting in the 7th century, uh, Malay was already a written language. Okay, so this is an example or a portion of the Kota Kapoor inscription from uh, Pulubanga. So, Malay written using uh, Indic script. That makes Malay one of the oldest languages in the world to have a uh, written uh, language, okay? Not many languages in the world were written this early. This is about as old as the age of written English. So you know, everyone's, well, many people here are very interested in English, but English, the history of English is roughly as old as the history of Malay, dating from uh, the seventh century. Because not many languages in the world have this very uh, old tradition of writing. So Malay was already a written language uh, more than 1,300 years ago. If we look at another inscription from just across the sea from Sumatra, if we look in West Kalimantan, but we have to go 350 kilometers inland, we'll find the Batu Pahat inscription uh, from Sakarao. Uh, it's written in Sanskrit, so it has the same age as the first inscriptions in Malay. So, so Malay and Sanskrit were vying, uh, were, were both being used in uh, the seventh century in maritime Southeast Asia. Uh, this is a very large inscription. It is about uh, two and a half meters high. So it's a very large stone in a very remote area. Um, and it's a, according to the Dutch scholars of the 19th and 20th century, these inscriptions are in Sanskrit, and they date from about uh, the seventh century. So what's interesting is we have Malay and Sanskrit both being used at the same period, roughly in the same area, using similar script, a script uh, invented for, the, for writing Sanskrit. Um, and this, uh, we know that this carried on. We have evidence from what they call, what is that? Padang uh, Roko here at the southeast edge of Provinsi uh, Sumatra Barat, or some of the later inscriptions that we'll find actually here in the Tanah Ketinggian Sumatra Barat itself. So uh, we have this evidence, as I mentioned, I think last night, this evidence that in Sumatra Barat, for example, we have a retention of using Indian Indic script, script from India, for writing Malay. So my question is, if the uh, Srivijaya Empire, based on uh, literacy in Indic script, based on Malay, based on Buddhism and Hinduism, no longer existed, does that mean that a new civilization was born? So this is sort of a question in my paper. In the 14th century, some people date at 1303, we find the first inscription in Malay, and this is 
wrong. It says Indic script. It's supposed to say Arabic script. Sorry. 1303, the first use of Arabic script that we have evidence of, Arabic script, for Malay. And this is from uh, the Malay Peninsula on the East Coast. Also a very remote area. It's uh, about 100 kilometers inland from the East Coast. This is the famous Batu uh, Betulis, Batu uh, from Trinkano. Uh, it, it promulgates Islam as the religion of that country. It tells people uh, what the rules are and what the, the punishments will be if you don't follow Islam. And it's all written in Malay and it's written in Malay in Arabic script. So this is the first evidence we have of Arabic script replacing Indic script as the written language of Maritime Southeast Asia. Um, it's very interesting because although it's in Arabic script and it's about Islam, we will not find the word Allah on this poem, on this song. This song uses the Wata Mulia Raya for God. So we're still at a transition period. People have converted to Islam, they're using Arabic script, but they have not incorporated some of the words from Arabic that we are very familiar with. Still many, many Islamic words. If you read my paper in the proceedings, you'll see a little bit about that. So by the 16th century, however, uh, things had codified, and we find that in 16th century, according to Anthony Reed, uh, Malay is identified with Islam. Malay is written exclusively, not completely exclusively, almost exclusively, in Arabic script, Arabic alphabet. No more Indic uh, syllabary, but an Arabic alphabet, except in some places, like Sumatra. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, Rajan and Blanco uh, were still using uh, Indic scripts to, to write uh, Malay. Uh, maybe not so much now. Okay, but anyway, in general, in the 16th century, uh, Malay was the language of Islam, and speakers of Malay were closely identified with Islam, according to Anthony Reid. Malay was written in uh, Arabic script, and the laws and legal systems of that era were all based on Islamic, uh, Islamic mode. So this is the second oldest letter. So. Uh, this is uh, sort of a symbol of what 16th century Malay was like. Um, the dominant use of Malay was as a written language in Arabic script. It was used for many purposes, uh, in this case uh, diplomatic letters between the Sultan of Ternate and the King of Portugal. Um, many other uses of Malay, uh, but uh, what's important to look at here is it's a written language using Arabic script and it's being used all throughout uh, maritime Southeast Asia. So maybe we have a paradigm, we can say we have a new civilization that emerged, no longer the civilization that we know of from Sumatra, the civilization uh, similar to Srivijaya, uh, that uh, Maharaja civilization based on Hindu and Buddhist uh, beliefs and the use of Indic script. We have a new civilization that's based on Islam and Arabic script. But within just a few years of the writing of those letters, we have what we might call another shift in civilization. Is that what we're looking at? Because by the 17th century, Malay has become also, besides being the language of Islam, it becomes the language of Christianity in Iran and Southeast Asia. So in the early 17th century, in fact, before that, even as early as 1546, Malay was used by Christian missionaries in these islands, in islands Southeast Asia. Certainly by the 17th century, we see that Malay is being used by uh, Christians for people living in Southeast Asia, and Malay is not written in Arabic script, but written in the Latin alphabet, and it includes not just religion, but also European laws. So here is the 1611 publication, uh, the, uh, one of the oldest books in Malay, certainly one of the earliest books, print books, 
intended for uh, people living in the archipelago. Not intended to teach uh, Dutchmen how to speak Malay, but intended to teach slaves how to read and write in Malay. And a little bit of Protestant religion. Okay? This was published in 1611, not in Island of Southeast Asia, but in Amsterdam. Uh, but it was used uh, in, particularly in Batavia and uh, very soon afterwards in other places, in particular Ambos. So this is a book that's intended for uh, slaves, some of whom were slaves from Island Southeast Asia, some were from other places, uh, India for example. Um, we're going to look at another document, which I think is an important document. This dates from 1632. Uh, this is Malay, written in Latin script. Again, Latin. This is a court document. This is probably the oldest evidence of uh, a Southeast Asian writing Malay in Latin script. This document was signed, you can see on the bottom, by someone named Jan Pais. He was the court clerk for the Dutch in Ambon. He'd been educated maybe with the very book we saw before, the 1611 book. He was an educated court clerk, but he was an indigenous uh, Ambonese. His village is right across the bay from Ambon City. He uh, came from Hakiwe, and he was a court clerk. And this is his writing and his signature about a court case about, of course, property. Most court cases in Indonesia are about so this is another one of those cases. And this young case, only a few years later, was brutally executed by the Dutch because he was said to be in, 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 in cahoots with uh, Islamic rebels, and he was uh, brutally executed. He was chopped into four pieces, and the pieces of his body were hung around town, brought in order. Because he, he was accused of being, he was accused of being, uh, working with the Islamic rebels in Hitu. So, education isn't as good as you think. There are dangers to education. Okay, okay, the point of these materials is, this is the oldest document I've ever seen or heard about uh, that has uh, uh, an indigenous, Priburi, uh, Southeast Asian, writing in Latin scripts, 1632. The previous book is probably one of the very first print books, uh, 1611, published for the use of Primumi, among others. Okay. So here we have here we have something sort of interesting. For maybe almost a thousand years, we have uh, yeah, for almost a thousand years, we have Malay as a written language using Indic script about Hinduism and Buddhism, and then. There's a shift, a very dramatic shift, starting in the 14th century. Malay becomes the language of Islam. And certainly by the 16th century, there was a very close identity between Malay as the language of Islam uh, and the use of Arabic script. And then, in this, so in the 16th century, uh, Malay emerges as a powerful language of Southeast Asia linked to Islam. But within 100 years, it's also become the language of Christianity. So, this is very similar to the use of English, for example, in England, where uh, the language itself became a point of contestation between Protestants and Catholics in England. The Protestants published a Bible in English, the Catholics published a Bible in English. The Protestants wrote about people who were killed by Catholics, the Catholics wrote about people who were killed by Protestants. So, this was uh, very important for the development of the national, of the language. English became a big language. One of the reasons was because of this use of English by two different religions. In Europe, there was Protestantism and Catholic Catholicism. In uh, islands of the of Islam and Christianity. But that's another story. Our question now is, um, thank you very much to Prof. James Collins. Um, I think Prof. James has uh, quoted a uh, very famous uh, uh, quotation about uh, civilization, uh, which mentioned here, which is by Prolo. But this quotation shows us that uh, civilization is uh, a social phenomenon. 
it is a social language is a one of the social phenomena. And civilization develops and it takes much longer time period than the society that supports the civilization. And practice has shown us how language uh, is related to civilization and how we can uh, how language has introduced us to many or different civilizations in the world. Specific, specifically the sign to Islamic civilization, uh, not only in Arabic countries but also here in uh, Nusantara uh, or an archipelago. So I think uh, there are many questions in our mind, uh, especially about how Malay has developed uh, through uh, from time to time in our country, particularly in Indonesia and Asian countries. And I believe you would like to ask some questions, and I'll give you some uh, uh, times to ask questions. We have about 20 minutes for the discussion. So maybe I give the first priority to the last side of mine. Uh, three from this side, like the first. Uh, then don't forget to mention your name. Uh, two from here and another side. Thank you very much for the moderator for giving me a chance to ask some of the questions to the keynote speaker. My name is Shahid Sanjusmandi from Madang. I work at the College of Teacher Training and Education. And to Professor Collins, it's a very astonishing for me for a young person living in this province to understand how the shape of historical images of shape this Malay language and it comes to this is this present day. And two things that I that makes me interested is your statement about the Arabic replaced the folk language or indigenous languages. And also Arabic did not replace the folk languages. Now from your explanation that you talked about the Persian and Urdu as in Iran but then I thought about my country that it seems that Arabic did not replace but it still exists. So in what way we can locate that kind of transition uh, in, in this country? That would be my first question. And the second is that you show us the pictures of the Indian description that the language or the spoken language is Arabic but the content is in Malay. And um, how should we see the transition in aspect of the uh, spoken languages to written languages? This is somehow very complicated at the point. Thank you very much. Kalau saya mengerti pertanyaannya itu tentang bagaimana transisi dari hanya bahasa tulisan menjadi bahasa tulisan. So, itu satu uh, kebanggaan. Uh, penduduk Nusantara bahwa bahasa Melayu bisa menjelma sebagai bahasa tulisan lebih dari 1300 tahun lalu dan seperti yang saya bilang tadi tidak banyak bahasa di dunia yang mempunyai sejarah yang sepanjang itu kan kita mengagungkan bahasa Inggris bahasa global itu pun umurnya sebagai bahasa yang tertulis sama saja dengan bahasa Indonesia karena bahasa Melayu sudah ditulis pada abad yang ke-7 sama seperti bahasa Inggris baru muncul sebagai bahasa tulisan pada abad yang ke-7 jadi itu meletakkan bahasa Indonesia bahasa Melayu pada umumnya pada jenjengan yang sangat tinggi di dalam penilaian peradaban um, peradaban manusia berdasarkan mempunyai sistem tulisan ini sangat hebat memang uh, Dari transisinya itu, uh, kita juga tidak tahu karena begitu bahasa uh, Sanskrit digunakan untuk pendidikan terutamanya agama uh, Buddha di uh, Sumatera Selatan 
sampai mulai muncul atau mulai timbul niat untuk menulis juga bahasa Melayu di dalam sistem tulisan yang sama. Jadi mungkin untuk komunikasi, untuk mendegakkan kuasa Maharaja Sriwijaya pada waktu itu, tetapi yang kita tahu bahasanya memang bahasa Melayu dan sudah dipaham pada batu pada abad yang dari transisi melalui uh, panah bahasa Maharaja Sriwijaya barangkali kan dari dari atas ke bawah tetapi uh, dibudayakan oleh masyarakat bawah kita tahu bahwa masyarakat Lampung, masyarakat Rejang, masyarakat Kerinci biasa malah menggunakan sistem tulisan yang masih berdasarkan sistem tulisan Hindi sampai 100 tahun lalu pun untuk menulis sajar, menulis mantra, menulis surat cinta uh, masih sistem ini uh, sistem ini berdasarkan sistem ini cuma biasa dibilang rencong dan sebagainya di sini di Sumatera. Oke, okay, so itu satu transisi yang luar biasa yang tidak dicapai oleh banyak peradaban di dunia. Banyak bahasa Eropa hanya mulai ditulis pada seribu tahun kemudian. Kan? Jadi uh, ini satu kehebatan, uh, kesedaran uh, penduduk Nusantara untuk mengubah bahasanya dari bahasa lisan saja menjadi juga bahasa tulisan untuk keperluan agama, permintaan, dan lain-lain. Uh, kan kalau kita melihat uh, dunia Islam, uh, negara seperti Syria, Lebanon, Palestina, Mesir, dulunya punya bahasa sendiri, malah masih masih digunakan sedikit sebanyaknya, misalnya di gereja gereja Kristen di Syria kan, gereja Katolik di Syria masih menggunakan bahasa purba Syria, ya kan? Tapi udah tidak digunakan secara umum. Saya rasa orang Kristen pun tidak menggunakannya sehari-hari. Itu hanya dikekalkan di dalam uh, bahasa uh, gereja. Nah, jadi kita lihat bahwa sebagian besar penduduk di Asia Barat, yaitu di sebelah barat Iran, sudah tinggalkan bahasa pribuminya menjadi penutur bahasa Arab. Bukan saja sebagai bahasa pemerintah dan pendidikan dan perniagaan, tetapi sebagai bahasa sehari-hari di rumah. Malah perlu saya baca buku tentang kota uh, Damsek, Damaskus, uh, malah di situ bisa dibedakan dialek Arab yang digunakan oleh orang Islam, dialek Arab yang digunakan oleh orang Kristen, dan dialek Arab yang digunakan oleh orang Yahudi sebagai bahasa sehari-hari. Oke, okay. so uh, itu fenomena di bagian barat uh, Asia dan juga sebagian besar Afrika Utara, Mesir. Libya dan sebagainya. Tapi kalau kita ke timur, mulai di Iran, walaupun para mulanya datang ke agama Islam di Iran, orang mulai menggunakan bahasa Arab untuk pemerintahan dan pendidikan. Tapi hanya bertahan sekitar 200 tahun, baru mulai muncul kembali bahasa Farsi yang mirip-mirip dengan bahasa Farsi bahasa Iran sekarang. Uh, jadi uh, sekarang walaupun agama Islam begitu penting di Iran sampai kepala negara harusnya ulama, ya kan? uh, penggunaan bahasa sehari-hari yang tidak berkaitan dengan agama Islam tetap bahasa Farsi. Jadi so, saya lihat uh, dalam hal itu uh, Nusantara, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei dan sebagainya, pola penggunaan bahasa agak mirip dengan Iran di mana bahasa Arab sangat penting di kalangan uh, Islam ya. Ya, kalau di Indonesia berapa 90% penduduk atau lebih, ya kan? Sangat penting dan banyak juga orang yang mengetahui yang pasti berbahasa Arab tetapi rata-rata tidak menjadi bahasa di rumah, tidak menjadi bahasa sehari-hari. Malah orang Arab yang tinggal di Indonesia, Arab peranakan misalnya, ya semuanya berbahasa lokal atau berbahasa Melayu atau berbahasa Indonesia dan sebagainya. Sampai ke satu dua menteri dalam kabinet Jokowi kalau tidak salah dan tidak tahu bahasa Arab, padahal mereka keturunan Arab. Oke, okay. so uh, ini kita melihat satu pola yang lebih mirip di Iran.
dibandingkan misalnya dengan Syria atau Mesir atau Palestina. Oke, okay? so sudah terjawab. Mudah-mudahan. Yang mau saya tanyakan Pak James, ada saya setuju dengan pemeran Anda, tapi di Indonesia sendiri yang mungkin sedikit berbeda dengan Malaysia, kami punya bahasa lain dan punya kultur lain yang mungkin bisa punya ilmu lain. Misalnya Jawa atau Bugis atau Bali sendiri itu relatif punya atau bahasa khusus dan juga situ situ. Hanya kata lain, saya sering mempertanyakan. Ketika itu diterjemahkan ke dalam bahasa Inggris itu menjadi Malay. Dan ini Indonesia biasanya tidak terkabar, itu seolah-olah hanya Malaysia. Padahal ketika bicara Melayu itu jelas-jelas Indonesia punya bagian Tentu saja bukan seluruh Indonesia, karena Indonesia Melayu itu hanya suku Jepang saja. Ini agak susah juga ketika di dalam bahasa Inggris Malay seolah-olah hanya Malaysia. Sama kalau kita menerjemahkan bahasa Jawa itu menjadi Jepang. Bahasa Jawa. Jepang juga Jepang, bahasa Jepang. Kalau bahasa Inggris, Inggris seharusnya bahasa Indonesia itu ada padanannya dalam bahasa Inggris apa? Nah, ini orang Indonesia sendiri saya pikir tidak bisa mengatakan itu. Nah ini ada satu missing, ada satu hal yang hilang saya pikir. Ketika Indonesia merdeka, konstelasinya berbeda dengan Malaysia juga ada di Thailand, di Malang. E, konteks Malay itu seolah-olah menjadi tereliminasi hanya Malaysia. Bagaimana tanggapan Pak Cheng sebagai? Uh, dalam bahasa ya, kalau dalam bahasa Inggris, uh, bahasa Indonesia, ya Indonesia, apalagi okay? Cuma menjadi pahaman saya dalam sistem saya di sini Dan konsep yang melandasi seluruh pembicara makalah saya Bahwa bahasa Indonesia, bahasa Melayu, bahasa Melayu di Brunei itu satu bahasa kalau tidak, mengapa kita bisa saling mengerti kalau bukannya satu bahasa, ya kan? Di dalam sejarah Amerika, dua kali berperang dengan Inggris, dua kali angkat senjata melawan Inggris, tapi tidak perlu membuat namanya bahasa itu. Pernah ada juga orang yang mau membuat namanya, tapi tidak jadi. Karena ya orang sedar bahwa bahasa itu bahasa yang sama mempunyai dasar sastra yang sama mempunyai sejarah yang sama. Uh, saya tidak mengusulkan mengubah nama bahasa Indonesia itu satu kebetulan di Amerika tidak mau mengubah namanya. Cuma orang Belanda apa bedanya bahasa Belanda dengan bahasa Jerman? Ya. Apalagi di perbatasan Belanda Jerman sama saja. Keluarlah dari perbatasan apa itu? Uh, di pinggir-pinggir uh, bagian timur Belanda, Belanda masuk ke Jerman itu bahasanya sama saja di rumah. Itu nilai yang sama, ya kan? Yang satu namanya bahasa Jerman, satu namanya bahasa Belanda. Abad ke-17, waktu orang Belanda datang ke sini, nama bahasa Belanda itu Dijks, yaitu Jerman. Uh, tapi tidak lama kemudian mereka ubah menjadi bahasa Hollands, ya kan? Lama-lama jadi Netherlands, ya kan? Oke, okay, tapi itu tidak mengubah kenyataan bahwa bahasa Belanda sebenarnya itu bahasa Jerman, ya kan? Tapi memang ada nama yang berbeda berdasarkan pada sejarah, uh, budaya, uh, politik, ya kan? Um, so dalam hal ini ya memang uh, bahasa Indonesia, uh, bahasa Melayu di Malaysia, bahasa Melayu di Brunei, malah bahasa Melayu di Thailand bagian selatan, uh, sama saling mengerti. Saya ke Thailand selatan. Mereka buka televisi sebentar nonton televisi Malaysia, baru buka kembali ke televisi dari Indonesia, syukurlah ada satelit kan. Uh, jadi itu bagi orang Thailand itu, itu bahasa yang sama, walaupun namanya apa, ya kan, walaupun namanya apa. Pernah saya berikan satu ceramah, satu makalah di Gorontalo, Gorontalo, ya lupa saya banyak ceramah, nah, Makassar, pokoknya Sulawesi sana lah. Terus saya berikan secara apa, ceramah tentang uh, sejarah bahasa Melayu. Terus ada mahasiswa yang kata, ya, itu bagus itu sejarah bahasa Melayu, bagaimana dengan sejarah bahasa Indonesia? Ya, kan capek rasanya. Kan? Apakah bahasa Indonesia hanya mulai pada tanggal 28 Oktober 1928? Ya kan? Ya kan tidak mungkin, itu meremehkan, mencemukan bahasa Indonesia karena dikatakan hanya bermula pada tahun 28 itu. Tidak masuk akal. Sejarah yang saya sampaikan ini adalah sejarah Indonesia yang dimiliki bersama.
dilakukan oleh semua orang yang menuturkan bahasa yang sama yang membentuk peradaban Asia Tenggara Lautan, Asia Tenggara Bahari, apa istilah yang berpengaruh, kan? Sudar, kan? Tapi kadang-kadang Sudar hanya berada di Indonesia, kalau di Indonesia. Jadi sebab itu saya sengaja memilih Merekan South East Asia, Asia Tenggara Bahari, kan? So, memang banyak faktor politik. Kadang-kadang Indonesia dan Malaysia, ah, saya pakai istilah Indonesia itu bukan ada di Norda di Sulawesi, kan? Bantu Barat. Walaupun saling memarahi, tidak bisa menghilangkan jejak dan kenyataan secara, dan tidak bisa hilangkan kenyataan bahwa program televisi di Malaysia dinikmati di Indonesia, program televisi Indonesia di nonton siang malam di Malaysia, ya kan? Lucunya dua dua negara pakai caption di bawah kan, tapi siapa yang mau membaca, ya kan? Ya kan? Orang yang mementingkan saya sudah tahu. Cuma memang peraturannya harus ada terjemahannya di bawah, baik Indonesia maupun di Malaysia. Kan capek mau membaca itu kan kita mau ikut sinetron, siapa mau melihat yang dilakukan di Jepangnya bagaimana kan. Oke, so seperti itu. Saya tidak tidak terlalu dapat mendengar pernyataannya Bapak tadi, tapi saya cuma mengatakan ya. Kalau bahasa Inggris ya, bahasa Indonesia itu Indonesian, tetapi kita sebagai sarjana. Kita tidak bisa menafikan ketertikatan semua bahasa yang sebagian dari peradaban Asia Tenggara Bahari. Terima kasih. Yeah, my name is Yong Wang Choi. I'm from Postdoctoral Studies here at Columbia University. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mrs. Lee. Uh, my question is about um, the division you are making of uh, the Arabic language. Uh, which is used to the east and to the west of the Middle East, if I may say so. Um, would you probably put that down to different migration patterns of indigenous Arabs? That's my question. Okay. Uh, uh, in English, uh, one of the interesting things is, is that, of course, many of the languages that Arabic replace in Western Asia, uh, Syria, Palestine, were already languages closely related to Arabic. So they belong to the family of languages called Semitic. So most of the languages that Arabic replaced were Semitic languages, that is, languages of the same family. Maybe this is an issue that Ipukatran is going to talk about in her paper, uh, where Indonesian is seen as replacing some local languages, maybe. And one of the reasons it can replace local, one of the reasons, probably, is because these languages are related. So it's easy to borrow, and then from borrowing, you move on to changing languages. So that might be one of the factors. So uh, I'll just quickly do something in Indonesian. So, bahasa yang diganti di Asia bagian barat itu, misalnya di Syria, di Palestine, dan sebagainya itu, sebagian besarnya juga satu keluarga bahasa dengan bahasa Arab. Dari nama keluarga itu, keluarga bahasa Semitik. Dari bahasa-bahasa uh, purba yang masih digunakan di gereja, itu memang serumpun, seasal dengan bahasa Arab. Jadi mungkin pernah diduga oleh beberapa sejarah, karena memang bukan bilang saya, bahwa mudah menggantikan bahasa yang serumpun, yaitu bahasa Semitik, dengan bahasa Semitik lain, yaitu bahasa Arab, yang belum dibawa, yang belum kuasa, dan lain so mungkin itu faktornya yang mempengaruhi. Because when you reach Iran, of course, Persian is related to English. It's another Indo-European language. So uh, Urdu is related to English. It's another Indo-European language. So both Persian and Urdu, my two examples of languages in Asia where Arabic did not be placed, uh, the local languages, come from a completely different language family. So obviously, Bahasa Farsi, Bahasa Urdu itu banyak sekali pinjaman dari bahasa Arab, sama seperti bahasa Indonesia kita, kan? banyak sekali pinjaman ya kan, tetapi tidak menggantikan bahasa, karena lain-lain rumpun bahasanya itu satu faktor, ada juga faktor-faktor budaya lain, uh, misalnya uh, di Farsi uh, peradabannya sangat tua, sangat tua sekali, ya kan? jadi dengan alasan peradaban yang sudah tua, bahasa Arsi muncul kembali. Ya kan? Begitu juga di Indonesia. Ya kan? 
saya sudah tunjukkan bahwa sejarah peradaban di, di uh, alam ini di, di Asia Tenggara hari ini sangat tua seribu seratus tahun jadi suka diganti dengan bahasa dari luar karena peradabannya sudah kukuh sudah lama sudah menjadi bahasa tulisan. We'll see mungkin in uh, in Patrick's papers that many of the languages that are threatened by la language shift. Uh, the creeping end of multilingualism are actually languages that are seldom written. Okay. So languages that are not written are more likely to shift, uh, but in the case of uh, Indonesian, which has a 1,300-year-old history of being written, I think uh, shifts are very unlikely, uh, very strong. And of course, there's a large number of speakers. In my latest edition of my book, uh, Sejarah Bahasa Melayu yang diterbitkan di Bukan Dunia di Obor Apa namanya? In the latest edition, I count today already 219 speakers of Malay. Of course, that includes Indonesia. Under some broader name. Okay, under, under some broader name. Okay, so, yes, uh, the naming of languages is very complicated and the factors that, that drive languages, the speakers of languages, shift their languages are also very complicated. So, you know, of course, I'm an American. I was born in America. My parents were born in America. Their parents weren't born in America. And most of those grandparents of mine uh, were not uh, native speakers of English. Okay? They shifted. Okay, so that's another story. And even though you still have some questions, so we we uh, like you to meet James after this and talk directly to him. So let me pay a pause to the great presentation of Professor.